Now imagine that you've got a tower of bricks. The more bricks you add on top, the more unstable it's going to get, and the more likely it is to fall over. It's kind of the same thing with nuclei as well. If you have a nucleus of carbon-12, that means it's got six protons and six neutrons. If you've got carbon-14 on the other hand, that means it's got an extra two neutrons. This one here, because it's got more neutrons, that means it's going to be more unstable, and so it's going to be more likely to decay. In other words, fall apart, split into smaller bits. By the way, we call these isotopes. They're the same element, but they have different mass numbers because they've got different numbers of neutrons. Now, if you have a nucleus of carbon-14 and you hold it in your hand, and let's say we can see when it decays, can we actually predict when a nucleus is going to decay? No, we can't. It's actually random. But there is a probability, there's a chance of this nucleus decaying in the next second. Now, at GCSE, you don't need to know about this, but at A-level, you do. We have something called the decay constant for an isotope for a nucleus. And that's given by the letter lambda, not wavelength in this case. That is the probability of a nucleus decaying in the next second. So its units are going to be s to the minus 1. This number is tiny though. It's very, very unlikely that if you're looking at an individual nucleus that it's going to decay in the next second. But if you've got enough of these nuclei, then you can say that chances are you will get some that will decay in the next second. We'll get on to how we can use this decay constant at A level a little bit later. But let's stick with the basics for now. If we've got a lump of radioactive material, at the beginning, we can say that none of the nuclei in this lump of radioactive material have decays yet. Then we're going to get lots of decays happening every second. And that's what we call radioactivity. Because we've got lots of undecayed nuclei, that means that if we say go, we're going to see lots of decays per second. So we've got a high radioactivity. By the way, we can measure this in counts per second. In other words, how many decays are happening per second. And that also has the name Becquerel. So Becquerel is just the number of decays per second or the number of decays we're measuring per second. But after a certain amount of time, half of the radioactive material in this rock has decayed. So that means that we only have half of the undecayed nuclei left than we had to begin with. So what do we call this amount of time to go from here to here? We call this one half-life. So what's half from here to here? Well, three things have actually. Half the undecayed nuclei. Notice that we say undecayed nuclei, not the number of nuclei that have decayed. The mass of undecayed material. And then finally, but most importantly, the radioactivity is halved. So if you want a textbook definition for what a half-life is, it's the time taken for the activity, or radioactivity, we can call it activity for short, time taken for activity of an isotope to half. Oh no, I did it. My spelling is not on point. There you go. If we went on from here, another half-life, how much of the undecayed nuclei and mass of the initial material and radioactivity would we have left? Well, it would be a quarter because we've gone through one half-life, so we've gone down to half, then another half-life, so it's gone down to a quarter. So we can represent this on a graph. So this is our time along the bottom. Now, time can be in any units. Chances are it's not going to be in seconds because half-lives are usually a lot longer than seconds. This might be hours, or it could be even days, or even years. We're going to go for days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we have activity up the side, radioactivity. And of course that's measured in Becquerel. Incidentally, activity doesn't have to be counts per second. It could be counts per minute, counts per hours, counts per whatever time you want, depending on how active the isotope is. So here's what a graph looks like. This kind of shape here that goes down and then levels out and doesn't actually get down to zero. It gets very close to zero if we carry on going, but it doesn't never get to zero technically. This is what we call exponential decay. And for A-level, you need to know what that means math-wise, and we'll talk about that in a minute.
but can we find out what the half-life of this isotope is using this graph? Yes, we can. Because look, we know the activity started at eight. Once we've gone through one half-life, what should the new activity be? It should be four. Let's go from four across to our graph. Then we're gonna go down. So half the initial activity takes us two days. So it seems like the half-life should be two days. Should we just check that once more though? Go through another half-life. What should the new activity be? It should be two. Let's go across from two. Lo and behold, it's taken another two days. So in this case, the half-life is two days. By the way, this doesn't have to be activity. This could be mass remaining or nuclei remaining of undecayed material as well. It would still work. Generally though, we go with radioactivity on the side. But what if you're not given a graph? What if you're just given some numbers? So we have a question here. We have an isotope where the radioactivity goes from 2000 Becquerel to 250 Becquerel in six days. How long is the half-life? Whenever you have a question involving half-life, you must remember to ask yourself this simple question. How many half-lives? Is it one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, maybe even four? Chances are we're probably not gonna go past four half-lives. How many half-lives have we gone through to go from 2000 to 250? Let's have a think, we started at 2000, half it once, we end up at 1000, half it again, we end up at 500, once more, we've got to 250. How many half-lives have we gone through? One, two, three, three half-lives. That's how many half-lives we've got. If three half-lives is six days, how long is one half-life gonna be? It's gonna be two days. Let's have a look at a similar question, but we're gonna flip it on its head. So if you've got something that has a half-life of 10 hours, what would the activity be after 40 hours if it started at 145 counts per second? But I'm telling you that in this case, 25 of that 145 is a background count. Whenever you have a background count, that means that you're measuring radiation that's coming from other sources as well. Maybe cosmic rays, maybe from radon gas, who knows? But all we need to know is that this actually isn't 145 for real. That's what we measure, but in reality, the activity of the source is gonna be, take away 25, 120. How many half-lives? One half-life is 10 hours, 40 hours. That means that we've got four half-lives. Oh, I did it again. So we're going from 120 down to 60, one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, and then one more. Seven point five counts per second or seven point five becquerels is our new activity. So just remember to ask yourself the question, how many half lives? Don't forget to watch out for background count as well. All you have to do is take it away from any readings you're given. So that's where the GCSE ends. If you do an A level note, let's have a look at the maths of this exponential decay in a little bit more detail. So a few symbols first. A is what we give to the activity of an isotope. And again, that's measured in, I'm gonna put per second because it's decays per second. We have lambda is our decay constant. Again, that's measured in per second. That's the probability of a nucleus decaying in a second. And we're gonna have N, undecayed nuclei remaining. And we're not gonna have a unit for that because, well, it's just a number. We know that the activity of a sample depends on how big it is or how many nuclei we have. So the more nuclei we have, the more activity. So we can say that the activity is proportional to N. To put an equals in here, of course we need a constant and that's our decay constant. A equals lambda N. So the activity is given by the number of nuclei left times by the probability of one of those nuclei decaying in a second. But just to acknowledge the fact that each decay actually reduces the number of nuclei, we are gonna put a minus in front of there to show that the number of nuclei is gonna go down with each little bit of activity. So that's our first equation, very important equation. So because we know that activity is actually a change in the number of nuclei left per second, we can rewrite this as dn by dt. If you don't know about dn by dt because you're not doing maths at A level, don't worry about it too much. This is basically describing the rate of change 
in our n. Now in order to do anything useful with this we need to have the n with the dn and we're going to have the dt over the other side so let's actually sort that out and to do anything useful with this we need to do something called integration if you don't know what this is all about don't worry about it you don't need to know the derivations for this this is just to show you where everything comes from. We take the constant out of the integration because well it is a constant that doesn't depend on t. So this ends up being the natural log of n equals minus lambda times t because well it's the integral of 1 so that gives us just t plus some constant. Now we have to find out what this constant is here so let's just have a think about our limits. If we take t to be 0 we actually have the log n of our initial number of nuclei and that's going to be equal to c so therefore that's our constant log of n0 so we can just pop that into here now say so the log n equals minus lambda t plus log n0. Putting all the logs on one side we end up with log n minus log n0 equals minus lambda t. Using our log identity we know that if we take away logs that's the same as taking the log of one divided by the other. Taking the exponential of both sides we end up with n over n0 equals e to the minus lambda t. So we finally ended up at our final version of this equation. So using this equation we can find out after a certain time what fraction of nuclei we have left compared to what we had at the beginning. This also works for mass as well but more importantly it works for activity as well. So if you've got a third of our original nuclei left this is a third so that means that e to the minus lambda t is also going to be a third. So what about half-life? And we're going to call half-life t half. Can we find out what happens when this time up here is actually the time it takes to have a half left? So this here is going to be a half, because we've got half the nuclei left, half the activity left. Let's get logs of both sides. Log of a half equals minus lambda times the half-life. Again, log identities. This is log 1 minus log 2. Log of 1 is 0, so that just disappears. So the minuses disappear as well. And we end up with half-life of something, rearranging this, is equals to the natural log of 2 divided by the decay constant. So then we come across another certain time. Instead of half-life, we're talking about a time constant. Now this is something that you come across in radioactivity and also capacitors as well. We're going to give it the symbol Tc. And this is a time such that e to the minus lambda t is going to be equals to e to the minus 1. In order for that to be true, we need lambda times the time constant to be equals to 1. The only way that we can do that is by doing the reciprocal of the decay constant. 1 over per second gives a second, so that works. Can you see that if this time here is 1 divided by lambda, then lambda divided by lambda just gives us 1. If you put e to the minus 1 into your calculator, it gives you this number. So the time constant for exponential decay in radioactivity and capacitors as well is always going to give you 37% of the original value. So that means that n over n0 equals 0.37. So there are our four really important equations and the important bit about time constant that we need to know for radioactive decay. When you're given a question you'll need to figure out which one of these ideas you'll need to use. Are you talking about time constant or are you talking about half-life or are you talking about just finding the activity from the number of nuclei and the decay constant or are we talking about finding a new activity or a new number of nuclei left after a certain time. That only comes with practice, so make sure that you practice as many questions as possible to do with radioactivity to get used to picking out the right equation. Now say that we have a source of gamma radiation and we have nuclei that are decaying. Now when we say decaying for gamma radiation, the nuclei aren't changing themselves, they're just releasing energy. How can we measure the number of decays that are happening every second. Well, we could theoretically make some sort of special spherical detector 
that's a distance r away from the source and that would detect everything wouldn't it theoretically that would be nice but in practice we can't really make something like that luckily though it's really easy to do it with just a gm tube a geiger muller tube or a geiger counter that's connected to a box and that can tell us how many counts per second we have and we're measuring now we know the area of the detector here now this area of the detector is only covering a tiny bit of this imaginary sphere but that's okay because we can say that the measured rate compared with the activity of the whole source is going to be the same as the area of the detector divided by the area of this whole imaginary sphere so it's going to be 4 pi r squared we can roughly find out what the activity of a source is now this can work for beta radiation as well but what you got to remember is that beta radiation is reduced by air a little bit so it works better for gamma it doesn't really work for alpha at all unless in a vacuum let's make another sphere here another imaginary sphere and uh, what i'm going to say is that this little sphere has a radius r1 and this big sphere that we had has a radius r2 now we know for a fact that all the radiation is going to pass through this imaginary sphere and this imaginary sphere but we know that for every meter squared of this sphere there's going to be less radiation hitting it than every meter squared of this sphere here so something has reduced for this big sphere and that thing is intensity intensity you can calculate by just taking however you're measuring the amount of stuff coming from something so that could be flux it could be energy it could be power but in this case we're going to say total radiation counts per second as well when we divide it by the area so intensity is always going to give you something per meter squared but because we know it's going to be the same for both spheres we can just call that a constant so k divided by area what is the area of a sphere again it's 4 pi r squared now this is a constant this is a constant this is a constant so that means that intensity inverse squarely proportional to the radius or the distance that you are away from the origin from the source in this case if that's the case then taking r squared over to the other side we can say that intensity times distance squared for a certain distance is going to be the same as intensity times the distance squared for another distance as well and this is our inverse square law so obviously if we move our detector twice as far away what's going to happen to the intensity well it's inverse squarely proportional so that's actually going to be halved and halved again the intensity is going to go down by a factor of four it's quartered move it three times away the intensity is going to go down by a factor of nine just be careful i'll try and catch you out with a question like what happens when you move two meters further away in that case we say that i1 r1 squared is equals to the new intensity because we've moved further away but we know our second distance is going to be our first distance plus two meters squared then all you have to do is rearrange factorize for r1 and bob's your uncle so if you think i've missed anything out or if you have any questions then please put a comment down below please leave a like as well if you found this helpful and i'll see you next time